Good day, Sir Sumar Chakrabati, who's a former president of the EBRD and advisor to the presidents of Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. We're very glad to have you here today for the launch of the Global Labor Resilience Index 2021 and to have the benefit of your insights. We have a first question for you, Suma, which is on the on the region of uh, Central Asia and South Caucasus, and in particular that the, the region has been progressing rather well on labor market resilience. What would be some of the reasons that you, you see that this region has been doing better on labor market resilience over the last five years? Thank you very much. Um, well, I think it, I always find it quite difficult to think of uh, Central Asia and South Caucasus as, as a single region. I think um, there are a number of uh, very different uh, types of countries, but it, it is good if we think of them as a region that they have been more resilient, uh, the labor markets have been more resilient than many other regions. And I think partly it's um, been a closer alignment, I guess, uh, between, you know, between the country's um, policies and also the trends that are out there, such as digitalization, obviously. Uh, I think they've made progress on that. I think they've also been trying several of them to improve their institutions generally. And I think that's had a, that's shown up in these indicators too. Um, it's interesting if you look at the countries in the uh, in the index with the highest labor resilience scores, um, Russia, Kazakhstan and uh, Turkey, very, very different profiles, actually. Um, so to tell a regional story is more difficult. I think it almost has to go into the detail of why each country um, did that. There are very clear differences in, in labor market resilience. I mean, clearly there are some countries which need to make more structural changes, I would say, uh, in order to support that resilience. But there are also those who I think need to improve uh, their resilience by addressing certain short-term policy issues. Um, and that, I think, comes through very clearly in the data. I mean, I think those who can make the more sort of what we might call cyclical changes, uh, what's coming through for me is the need for them to support innovation, to support entrepreneurship and economic diversification, particularly towards more of the green economy, if you like, as green as the source of growth. Um, and that is a quite a big, big challenge because for many still in this region, they tend to think of it as, as a trade-off between green and growth. Whereas actually, I think what your story is telling us actually is to see them as uh, not a trade-off, but actually something that's consistent with each other. So green growth is something that we should be pushing more throughout this region to build resilience. Thank you, Suma. So you rightly highlight that there has, has been progress in those two regions of South Caucasus and Central Asia, but there are still areas for improvement compared to, let's say, the um, top level benchmarks in labor resilience, namely the Nordic countries uh, uh, as, as one group. Um, what would you summarize for you as maybe the top the top areas for improvement for the, for the region? Well, if I look at, um, you know, if I if start by looking at um, uh, the countries I know best, Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, I would highlight two things in particular. One is this green growth. Uh, issue, I think that's uh, you know it's it's interesting that when you have discussions with policymakers in both countries, it's not an issue that comes immediately to the front of the queue. Um, it's seen as still something which is more about your international commitments uh, through the UN and others, uh, through your uh, support for the Paris Agreement, rather than something you have to build into domestic policy making. But it's absolutely crucial. Um, in the case of Kazakhstan, of course, it's been very much dominated by an oil and gas economy. Diversification into a greener path is absolutely necessary. But Uzbekistan too. Um, it also has a oil and gas industry, not as dominant. Uh, it's a more probably a more diversified economy already. But it also needs to do far more in solar, wind and sort of power generation as well. The second issue, I think, that again uh, is very important in both countries is gender for me, I think, in terms of building greater re resilience. Um, there are still many occupations here which are uh, barred by law uh, for women to actually apply even. Uh, that has reduced in both countries, but still a long way to go. And I think uh, you mentioned the Nordic countries. I think one of the reasons, of course, that they've done very well is the, the what they've done in terms of having high um, female employment ratios 
compared with uh, many other countries as well. I think that is a, it's a very important dimension of not just fairness, but also in terms of resilience as well for the future. So I think those are two areas I'd highlight where um, as advisor to both presidents, I'm certainly pushing uh, those agendas. Uh, I want them to be much more front of mind, front of queue, if you like, in, in the thinking on policy and structural reform in, this, in both countries, because I think it's so strong to resilience. Very clear. Thank you. So, uh, Sumo, and in your answer, what's interesting is you're also highlighting these two dimensions of resilience, which are the structural component and the more cyclical policy component, which let's say is relatively shorter term. Yeah. And um, in particular, that uh, part of structural um, resilience is economic diversification and moving away from dependence on one or two, yeah. one or two sectors. So um, um, definitely, uh, it seems to be on the agenda, at least for the two countries that you that you highlight. Now, moving from the region and turning to one of the countries that you really do uh, know, know best, which is uh, Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan was ranked 49th uh, out of 131 countries in the Global Labour Market Resilience Index. And uh, they improved their resilience by 10 places since 2016. Could you elaborate on some of the policies that you think Kazakhstan has been able to put in place Stop. to improve its labor market resilience? Sure, and I think this is a, a really important shift in, in the right direction, obviously, for Kazakhstan. Um, but what we mustn't do here is rest on our laurels. Um, it's a good uh, improvement, 10 places, as you say, in the last uh, five years. That's very good. Kazakhstan, of course, I think it does have some advantages uh, in terms of I guess what we might call structural and cyclical components of labour market resilience. It has um, made, I think, a major shift in terms of uh, the business environment, uh, really for starting a business. So uh, it's eased procedures to start a business. It's made it much easier to get credit. Uh, and it uh, takes much less time nowadays to start a business than it used to. I think that's been very, very important. The second area, which I think is quite a historic area, but it's begun to pay off now in big ways, education. Um, and if you look at particularly tertiary education improvements, I think in your index, Kazakhstan went up by some 22 places uh, over this period. And the quality of its research institutions, uh, which is something it's really wanted to build, has really improved. Uh, again, I think a 17 point increase in the index. And in back in uh, 2015, um, Nazarbayev University was opened uh, with its own research centers. I think that's made a major contribution to this uh, as well. Um, and this is really important, I think, in terms of uh, bringing education to the forefront of the resilience uh, point. I think, by the way, I, th I mean, I'm someone who believes Kazakhstan needs to go further on this. So while it's had a well-educated population, uh, as we know, and it is really focused very much on the first and second degrees, if you like, for um, for its uh, in its tertiary education efforts. Uh, I think actually Kazakhstan's next stage has to be much more in-service executive education, managerial leadership type training, so that the quality of its uh, public administration particularly improves over over the time. And that was that is important again to the resilience uh, picture as well. Economic diversification, well, it's a work in progress in Kazakhstan. Um, I mean, it's, uh, it's something that everyone has at the top of their agenda, uh, and it's going to become more and more necessary. I mean, President uh, uh, Tokayev has made this a big big part of where he wants the economy to move to. Uh, there are opportunities, I think, uh, in terms of agribusiness and tourism. Uh, but um, a real effort needs to be made to make those sectors rival oil and gas. But they'll have to, because oil and gas um, has dominated the economy, but it's getting more and more expensive to explore that oil and gas uh, give, uh, compared with other countries, one. And two, of course, the oil price isn't exactly uh, where it used to be. So there's an absolute need to move on diversification. There's been a good, uh, more recent development, I think, on moving towards what I call a green economy, uh, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, certainly, you see a huge increase in renewable energy uh, investment. My own former organization, EBRD, invested in the first solar, the first wind uh, projects in this country several years ago. 
Um, and Kazakhstan actually was the first Central Asian country to int introduce an auction of renewable energy sources to try and accelerate this uh, progress towards a low carbon economy. And I think that's going to be a big part of Kazakhstan's future story as it moves away from oil and gas as well. And the other thing that's important to the resilience picture is infrastructure. And there's been a really big push in Kazakhstan to um, invest in infrastructure, uh, both of the hard uh, type and also the soft connectivity, as I would say. So not just the old roads and uh, power plants as well, but ICT infrastructure as well. And that's shown up, in, I think, in a, a positive move by about seven places, I think, and Kazakhstan moved up in your uh, ICT access uh, index. Um, so that's good. And I think that's an area where, again, part of diversification will require Kazakhstan to invest more on the ICT side as well. So those are some of the ingredients, I think, that explains uh, how Kazakhstan has really improved its uh, positioning uh, on this index as well over the last five years. Very good. Thank you, Suma. All of these are important elements. I wanted to zoom in on a particular area, which is youth. Um, in general, in the index, uh, there's a lot to do in terms of improving labor market resilience for the, the, the youth uh, category. There aren't enough active labor market policies, uh, if you want, and except for some of the countries like, like the Nordic uh, ones, uh, mainly with youth guarantee uh, uh, programs, for instance, um, where you know, youth is left out uh, in terms of not only unemployment, but needs, you know, not in education, training or, or, or employment. Kazakhstan, relatively speaking, has done pretty well in, the, in this area. Apart from having a, a relatively young population, um, youth is quite well employed. Are there some things you think the country is doing well in this regard and what could be done better? Sure. Well, I think you, you've, you're absolutely right. I think youth um, unemployment particularly is one of the biggest uh, challenges across the world in terms of resilience uh, and certainly in the countries when I was EBRD present, the, uh, one of the issues I was most worried about in many of the emerging markets was the inability of those markets to uh, create sufficient uh, number of jobs, uh, high value adding jobs uh, for young people entering the labour market and I saw this very, very much as a not just an economic and social issue but political, uh, polit politically highly dangerous uh, in not being able to do so. and. In a way, the Arab Spring was partly caused by this problem as well. So, but you can see it not just in North Africa, you can see it in Western Balkans, you can see it in many regions. Now, you're right, Kazakhstan has uh, done well. Um, I think uh, in, in this respect, comparatively speaking, it has a low youth unemployment rate, comparatively speaking. Um, and it has a young population, so this is quite important to, to get right. Uh, and I think it's understood that youth have to be at the centre of uh, its recovery policies, particularly now after the pandemic. Uh, what has it done? Well, I think I mentioned earlier that obviously it has invested a huge amount in the education of its population. Probably most uh, most well known are some of the, the tertiary level investments it's made uh, through Nazarbayev University, through the Bolashak program, of course, which is much admired in many other emerging markets. Uh, although one of the interesting issues about that program uh, is at the moment I think only 5% of graduates from that program work in public administration. Uh, the other 95% are either in the private sector or abroad. So there's been a whole issue about you know whether Kazakhstan has, the public sector, has gained enough from this program as such. Um, so, but no doubt it's a, it's a program that has made a big difference I think. And we should thank the first president for his far-sightedness on that actually. Um, also, I think there are signals, and I call them signals, important political signals given by uh, the second president now. He declared 2019 to be the year of the youth in Kazakhstan. Um, clearly, that gets a lot of attention, particularly from young people. Lots of programs and opportunities created for youth, Zaj Maman, uh, Zaj Kasipker as well. This is very much aimed at youth entrepreneurship, uh, and there are also various uh, state programs in housing as well to try and help the youth uh, onto the housing ladder earlier than many other countries have managed to do. And I think probably one of the less known but quite important sing signals given by the president is uh, to try and get youth to engage more in the political arena, to try and actually 
help to become part of the leadership that designs the policies for their generation, if you like. And here there's a program called Zaj Otan, for example. This is the youth wing of the ruling party, Nur Otan. Uh, that uh, wing was created really to represent the interests of, of young of youth of Kazakhstan. Uh, and also now a special quota has been introduced by the ruling party, for itself, of course, to increase the share of uh, its uh, youth members in parliament. So this is actually quite interesting. Um, uh, the, a lot of effort has been made on that. I, I want equally a lot more effort on the gender uh, angle as well. Uh, but uh, it's fully understood. And then I think on top of that, there have been some policies, active labour market policies, like the Roadmap Employment 2020, which, which focus a lot on youth un, uh, unemployment and trying to combat that. So this is um, a big part of uh, the picture here in Kazakhstan. I think as, as the economy recovers and hopefully diversifies more over the next decade or so, it's particularly we need to think about those um, industries and areas where youth can play a big role, but we need to think about a better match between, I guess, what the universities are producing and what the uh, tertiary sector generally is producing and what we need in the economy. So to give you some examples, I think for the tourism sector in Kazakhstan to be successful as an employer of young people, uh, for sure, two things are going to have to happen. A greater focus on learning English uh, so that tour operators, hotels and so on can actually in, in, actually um, engage with foreign tourists uh, in the right way, uh, or not just foreign tourists in the elite hotels, but also the backpacking uh, foreign tourists. Uh, I think that's going to be very much very important. Secondly, a focus on, for example, hospitality skills. You know, there are countries, emerging markets like Jordan, which have fantastic sites. We know them all, Petra, etc. Great hotels too, but the quality of hospitality in those five-star hotels was not of the standard that was required to attract tourists. There, interestingly, the government recognised this and set up a sector skills council. Uh, working actually with Indian hotels uh, to learn how to transfer the skills in Indian hotels to the Jordanian ones. It's things like that that I think we have to start focusing in on at a more granular level in Kazakhstan, uh, really, and also Uzbekistan, I'd say, which will uh, translate into good job opportunities for tomorrow's youth as well in a new sector like tourism, uh, where we want to really uh, we want much higher volume to come through uh, in, into that sector. So lots of opportunities. I think quite a, quite a bit done, but a lot more to do to really integrate youth into the future labour market of Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. Thank you so, so much, Akhavati. Um, quite a lot done, but uh, still some things to do is a great way to summarise uh, this very rich uh, interview with you. So we thank you once again uh, for being here with your insights on the launch of uh, the Global Labour Market Resilience Index 2021. Thank you very much, Anthony.